Hey everybody, Chris here. Today's episode is a module from our new course, Shape of Power, created by Nate with some help from me. And you can go check that course out at the link right there in your show notes. The course is designed for climbers who are uh, two to three years into their journey and really want to dig more into the fundamental movements that are the basis of of pretty much all the moves you'll do in your climbing. In the course, Nate breaks it down into two distinct shapes, uh, square and twisting, which we've been calling squares and squiggles, and also into two types of movement, one being static, one being more dynamic. Um, With those fundamentals, you can build almost everything that you're ever going to do in climbing. So if that sounds interesting to you, Go check it out. There are also several other free modules that you can take a look at while you're there. This module is from the end of the course when we're talking about bringing in all the skills that you've learned throughout the course together into your climbing, leveling your skills up, so to speak. Since most of the course takes place indoors in climbing gyms, we decided for these discussions to sit outside up in the mountains. So you are going to hear some wind. You may or may not hear some cows. All right, let's get into it. So you now know how to practice skills. You know, we've gone through that with this course. This last video, we talked about how to highlight what skills to work on. So now we're going to talk about, okay, you found your skills. We have all these individual exercises. You know what? This just occurred to me. I wish it was as easy as like coming into a new town, like you're playing Legend of Zelda or something, and you talk to the shopkeeper and he's like, you need this. Oh, yes. I wish it was that easy. That's sort of what our What, When, How to Train series of the podcast is. Yeah. We're the shopkeeper in the new little town. That would be great. Sorry, total. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sidebar. No, I mean, that's <laughs> like, because figuring out what we need to work on can be tough. And then once you even know, it's like, It takes a lot of work. Like this is a continuous and kind of endless process. Um, So I'll, you know, I'll say this a couple times, but have fun with it. Like this is something that I think I've been climbing something like 16, 17 years now. Chris has been climbing, I think 25, 26. Mm -hmm. And we still practice new skills and we're still finding new skills to work on and learning new ways to develop these skills. Um, So yeah, learn how to have fun with it. Like, this can be a really fun process. Like, I love more than anything else, like, finding something new. I mean, like, oh, hold on. I didn't I didn't know this was a weakness. And then you get to go down this whole rabbit hole of, well, how do I work on it? How do I attack it from all these different angles? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then once you've, like, you've mastered a skill for your level of climbing, um, and then your other skills start to grow and you're in a new level of climbing and all of a sudden the skill you had mastered, there's more you can add on top of it. You know, and that just keeps going as far as you go in climbing. And that's why 26 years in, I'm still learning new skills. Oftentimes they're just like the next layer of a skill I'm already well versed in. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, uh, we like to bring up this idea of a video game character, how you have all these different attributes that you're trying to level up. And so, and I think that's a great way to think about skills too. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, let's say if you're trying to work on your twisting momentum and you've done it for your warm ups for a while, it's starting to feel comfortable. Awesome. That's great. That is, you know, let's say that's like, you've gotten to level one out of 99, you know, 99 is the, uh, elusive level of mastery that maybe one of us will one day hopefully get to. Mm-hmm. But there's this option of getting, of leveling up all these different skills. Um, so yeah, when you're, let's say you find a new skill, twisting momentum, we'll use it as an example, you know, first use that in your uh, beginning warm up. 
once that starts to become more relaxed, almost mindless to where you're like, oh, this is just happening automatically, level it up a little bit. You know, whether that's going to a slightly higher grade, maybe going to harder styles for you, just keep finding ways to tweak your practice a little bit to where it's still just a little bit challenging. You know, it's, you're going to have to learn something even just small, new every day. Like every day you should be able to walk away and be like, oh, like, what did I learn? And you should be able to list something, you know, whether that's, oh, I learned how to create more momentum while climbing in dihedrals while twisting, you know, things like that. Um, and as you go, we're just going to keep leveling up. So this starts with warm up, build up to higher ones. And for me, like a good example, I've been working on eyes on the prize, but at a fairly high level. So for me, that is just a notch below my project level. So these are really hard repeats for me. Something that may have taken me two, three days to do before. I now want to try and repeat them with that early drill that I showed you, eyes on the prize, where I'm really paying attention to how I'm grabbing handholds and watching my foot all the way until it gets to footholds. And for me, that's a really hard thing to practice at that level. But I've taken the time and kind of built up to there. So if I want these skills to translate into my highest level projecting and performance, this is what I need to do. I need to keep leveling them up. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, you'll know when you've reached a level where you can start to back off a little bit um, on your focus. Because it's very easy to focus on something until you're really good at it and then just keep focusing on it because now you're really good at it and you mm. can go in the gym and you can smash this thing and it looks cool and everybody's like whoa how do you do that but when it starts to show up in your performance just by accident like you recognize oh look at that i just twisted on this move that i know normally i would have done square um but i just fell into this twisting movement naturally that's when you can say, okay, I'm going to take the foot off the gas a little bit and, you know, put my energy elsewhere and start leveling up this next skill that, you know, maybe isn't showing up in your natural climbing yet. Um, and eventually you'll, you'll be leveling up all of these skills and your climbing will just be, you know, your level of climbing will be raised as a result of that. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, one of the things that really separates great climbers from good climbers is it's not so much that they know more skills than good climbers, but it's that they can kind of automatically pull on those skills yeah, and rely they can on access them. Access them at any moment. Yes. They've and in the right situations. Exactly. They've developed their skills to this automatic level so that they still do have to make conscious decisions. But so many things are automatic for them. Um, you know, a good climber may know all of these skills, like they have a general idea of them, but they haven't understood them well enough that when they get on something hard, the right skill shows up at the right time. Um, and, you know, that's what we're going for. We're trying to make these things automatic, like what Chris was just saying. Um, you know, just two days ago, there was a really cool thing happen that happened uh, when we were climbing together in the machine shop. Chris's home gym, Chris was doing a circuit, and as he started to get pumped, he relied on clothes crimping for maybe the first time ever on this boulder. Yeah, definitely. No question. It's a, it's a skill I've been working on for over a year now, uh, maybe 18 months at this point, and, and it's just really starting to show itself in my normal performance, and this was a big one for me because it was on a hold that I've used hundreds of times. I have always half crimped that hold because I'm, that's what feels best to me there. Yeah. But I was in a new situation on that hold where I was a little more pumped, a little more powered down. I needed to feel like I had a little more control and I just naturally went into a full crimp, which has never felt like more control for me uh, until then. And I recognized it. Nate saw it happen. And when I dropped off the boulder, I was like, whoa, what just happened? You know, and that's a big moment in this pursuit of mastery of a skill is when it pops up 
in your normal climbing, especially in a situation where you know you, you would not have done that prior. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like best case scenario. And so like Chris said earlier, when you feel that start to happen, you know, when you suddenly start finding yourself using these new skills just automatically, awesome. You can stop prioritizing it quite as much because once it's automatically happening, that skill is going to maintain itself um, just so much better than it would if it's not. Like mm -hmm. it's just naturally happening, so it's going to kind of take care of itself to some degree. So you can kind of throttle back on that and start prioritizing something else that isn't showing up in your climbing yet. Um, now, when we talk about leveling up skills, you know, uh, one of the biggest ones for me, and I've talked a little bit throughout this course, how I started climbing as a very square sloth climber. Just everything was pull up, lock off, stay square. Um, I had been told early on that climbing statically was kind of the best style. You know, it was, and that's what it was, it was style. It was like, oh, well, you know, doing something dynamic is more sloppy, you know, and anyone can just be dynamic, but if you can climb statically, you're controlling it. It builds more strength. Um, same thing with climbing square. And unfortunately, I just fully believe that without putting enough thought behind it. And I didn't develop my momentum skills. So fast forward a couple years, and I hit a really hard plateau. You know, I had hit a hard plateau at around the V6, uh, breaking into V7 range. Like, V7s took me a lot of time. They're always either in my style or I just broke them down to where I forced them into my style, which made them drastically harder. And I had a semester in college where I didn't think I was going to have a lot of time. And I was like, you know, I have other things going on in my life. I don't have as much time to climb as much as I had been before. You know, at that time, I thought you just had to climb outside every day. And it's the only way you got better. Um, looking back now, it's like, oh, I, I had lots of time. But at the time, I was like, oh, what do I do? Um, I had just read Dave McLeod's 9 out of 10 Climbers. And he was like, hey, you know, you should be able to use momentum well. So I decided, okay, I'm going to pretty much make this my main focus. Like, I still spend a little time trying hard boulders and projecting. But anytime I went into the gym during the week... I would practice momentum. So initially, like I didn't even climb the set boulders. I would just make up moves and I would say, okay, like I can lock off this far, anything further. And I feel like I have to jump, like feet off. I didn't have that control where I could create speed, keep my feet on and kind of guide myself up the wall. So I just started practicing that. I made up really small moves that would have been insanely easy if I would have just jumped. Like I could have easily cut feet, jump, swung, put my feet back on. I never would have fallen on this move. But instead, I decided, okay, this is how I'm going to do this. I'm going to force this style. Um, I created these, in essence, style projects. You know, maybe V6 was my project level at the time, but these were, I mean, V2, V3, honestly. But in this style, they felt just incredibly hard. And so I started doing that with these little makeup boulders. And then I started trying to apply this to more set problems. And so I would try and climb the set problems with the same style. And over the course of this full semester, so let's say about four months, I got to the point to where it started feeling a little bit more natural. And over the next year and a half, I ended up jumping up about three grades. Like I went from V7 being a really hard project level that I could only do a few in a couple of styles to I think I ended up in a year and a half climbing about eight V10s. And it's something that never would have happened had I not really taken the time and said, this is my weakness. I'm going to focus on it. You know, and I was falling on easy boulders, yeah. like warm up level <clears throat> boulders for months. But I took the time and I kept leveling it up until it was no longer such a big weakness that it held back all of my climbing. Yeah, I think that's the thing a lot of people miss actually about climbing in the gym, uh, practicing in the gym, is that we often tend to sort of wait until a problem shows itself that will force us to climb a way that exposes our weaknesses, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when in fact, all of these things that go up in the gym are completely arbitrary anyway. It's just someone putting holds on the wall. So 
why can't we add in our own artificial difficulties and say, this is now my twisting momentum project, or this is my mm -hmm. square momentum project, and I'm going to learn how to dead point, you know, by forcing it. Whether I have to do a dead point or not, I'm going to force myself to do a dead point. Um, yeah. And I think it's really a really valuable way to practice that a lot of people totally skip over. Yeah. You know, and uh, as cool as it was in hindsight, I can look back and be like, oh, I jumped a bunch of grades in a short period of time with some dedicated practice. And that's cool. But man, I also plateaued for like a solid year very early in my climbing, yeah. like a stage where ideally you shouldn't be plateauing within your first couple of years. Like you should, it would have been so much better. And honestly, like I probably would have made it to that grade like faster possibly mm -hmm. like had i just really paid attention to all styles i wouldn't have had this whole year of being like man i don't understand why i can't climb harder than yeah. v5 v6 and honestly even like there were times v4s i just couldn't do even though i had climbed v7 and it's because i had left just a massive gap in my skill like skill set yeah. so yeah really work broadly like try and level up everything you know we've talked about this like it's important to have strengths, but the less we can have weaknesses, the harder you're going to be able to climb and the more your strengths will really shine through. Um, yeah, you know, I already said this, but have fun with it. Like, this is, I mean, I, I think we've been smiling. I've been smiling. Chris, I don't think smiles. <laughs> I don't smile. I've been smiling through all of this talking about practice because I love it. Like, it's such a joy to find something and realize, like, oh, this is this new thing I can work on. Like, for me right now, I'm you know, working on eyes on the prize and maybe some specific types of shoulder engagement and to find these things and then say, oh, this is going to apply to so much of my climbing. It's going to let me do all of these other things I already like, but better. And then just like really pick it apart. Um, it's great. Um, yeah. So do it, have fun with it. Uh, one last note, Chris had mentioned in the last video that a good way to find skills is if you don't feel comfortable doing it in front of other people and i will go on and say if you want to practice new skills a great way to do it is find an empty part of the gym like you don't have to do everything in front of other people and especially with learning a new skill it's been shown in research that for most people it's actually helpful to learn new skills alone and then perform typically in a group you know a lot of us who climb we recognize that like I love going out with my friends to go try hard and just give a top end effort. That's my favorite thing. But if I'm trying to practice something new, being able to do it alone is great. Being able to kind of spend time with yourself, like back flop off of things and not have to worry about how you look. I told you you were going to hear some cows. Wasn't lying. All right. If that sounds interesting to you, if that's something that you feel like you would benefit from diving into, please go check it out. Shape of Power. Uh, you can find it at Power Company Climbing Academy. You can click the link right there in the show notes in your pocket supercomputers to get there. It's only 48 bucks, which as far as I'm concerned is a massive steal uh, for the work that's been put in for the amount of content and lessons that you get inside of this course. So go check it out. We are also actively working on more courses. I can't tell you just what yet. Top secret, but it's coming. All right. In the meantime, you can find us on the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the Pinterest, the YouTubes, where you can also see a video of this conversation along with many others. You can search for us on the Twitter. My new podcast, Hip Hop Taught Me Everything with Devin Dabney, is on the Twitter. But the Power Company podcast is not because we don't tweet. We scream like eagles. This time, 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 this This time to build power. This time, 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 time to build power.
Radio. 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 Radio.